Well, welcome to the Antilles Episcopal Conference Facebook Live conversation on Synod and the Synodality. I am Father Donald Chambers, uh, Secretary General of the Antilles Episcopal Conference, and with us this morning um, to discuss Synod and Synodality, we have the President of the Antilles Episcopal Conference, uh, Bishop um, Gabriel Milesier of the Diocese of Roseau. We also have uh, Mrs. Teresa Best Downs, who is the Episcopal Delegate for Youth from the Archdiocese of Port of Spain, Trinidad. And uh, we have Miriam, Miss Miriam Yores, uh, um, from the Diocese of Belize City, Belmabon, um, working with youth. Uh, working with Synod, all persons are engaged in Synod um, this time, as Synod is truly the buzzword in the Catholic Church today. So without further ado, we can say that um, the Pope Francis launched the Synod last week, Sunday, October 10, with the theme, the theme Synod, Participation, Journeying, uh, communion and mission. So let me ask, um, first of all, Bishop Miles here, share with us why we're having a synod on synodality. We have had so many synods throughout the last, say, 10 years. We've had a synod on youth and vocation. We've had a synod on family life. We've had a synod um, on the, 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 the Amazon caring for the, the earth. Why a synod on synodality? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Um, and I'm sure it is a, a question that is, that is um, going through the minds of many people. But I think what um, the Holy Father uh, invites us to is to try to rediscover the real nature of the church, the real nature of the church. Now, that is, of course, saying um, as if it is saying that we have not living up to it in the past. Um, you have mentioned rightly that we've had many, many synods, but um, there is a dimension to it that is very important for us to realize um, based on the fact that it is calling the entire church to journeying together, journeying together. In the past, um, since Vatican II, um, when we spoke of the Synod of Bishops, it was the gathering of bishops in Rome under the authority and guidance of the Holy Father. And uh, um, of course, they took decisions, they discussed uh, a topic and, and um, they took decisions uh, for, the, for the entire church. But in this, this time around, the Holy Father is calling the entire church to, to journey together, to listen to each other, so that they will, come, they, they will formulate pastoral decisions that would address the needs of the entire church. So the synodality, uh, that entire process, the process of listening, of participation, of coming to communion and organizing mission is really um, the whole process which is coined as synodality. So the, the Holy Father is calling us to a new style, a new style, a new way of seeing ourselves as church and seeing ourselves as missions um, carrying out the, the, the message of Christ in our world. So rediscovering the real nature of the church, which has always been there, um, but somehow we could say that we may have lost track of that. And so you speak about journeying together uh, as a people youth, laity, religious, clergy, everyone journeying together, um, participating, as you said, uh, Bishop, in a process of, of listening, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church as it carries out its mission in the world today, and particularly in this time of pan pandemic. So you know, thanks for reminding us that this Synod process is one of journeying together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Teresa, from your from where you sit, uh, can you share with us how this this synod will impact um, will impact youth in particular, laity, 
um, in particular, as, as we're journeying together, picking up on that theme of journeying together, how do you think it will impact on youth and, and the laity? <clears throat> well, I think for the most part, we, the intention is that through this synod process, the young church will become uh, more active. There's an intention as a part of the synod that young persons who are within the church and young persons who may be on the periphery of faith feel more directly listened to as a part of the process. Now, I say it's an intention because we do have to really extend ourselves to ensure that we are listening and listening appropriately because we know you, and you know, many of us really, you're here and many are listening to many mm -hmm. different things. And so it is important that if we are keeping the impact and the goal in mind, which is, as Bishop said, a journeying together of walking with, then we should be clear in our minds that the impact and the intention that is desired is actually to experience one another. And that means not being afraid to experience young people for all of the things that we say about them because of them and so on. So I, I think there's a desire from the Pope, from our bishops as well, to really see young people at, in the church, but also to have them see themselves as necessary as essential and valuable as a part of this movement within the church at this time. And I like the, your emphasis, Teresa, on the, 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 the component of experience. Um, how are we going to experience each other, uh, particularly knowing that, that each of us, each group, um, including our, our youth and, and lady, they come with a particular experience. And, and the question is, how are we going to be uh, open to each other's experience, to listening to each other's um, experience. Uh, so I, I, I rather like the, I like to underline that word that you that you use or that component of experience. We move to to Miriam um, with this anticipated experience that Teresa uh, spoke about. What have been some of the expectations you are picking up on the ground? as you started working in, with this in a uh, process? What are some of the expectations? <laughs> well, it's been a blessing so far. It's had its challenges, but um, what I have been gathering is that I've learned a lot about others as well as myself. Um, many of us uh, young people want many things but I think one of the important things is to be listened to but in being listened to we also expect that we will listen to others and that is not something easy it might carry a technical component to it but there's also a spiritual realm I feel because Listening to someone takes on sharing faith and sharing experience. And I think that having that love for neighbor and for oneself, for God, are essential parts of the listening process. So as I go about, I'm hearing a lot of a call, a call for love a call for peace and a call for hope amongst ourselves as the family of God. Miriam, you spoke about very profoundly, indeed, I dare say, about this listening process. We, you've learned about yourself and about others. If you don't mind sharing with our, our listeners, is there any one thing that you can point out that you have learned about yourself and you have learned about others as you engage in this listening process, if, if you don't mind sharing with our, with our listeners? Well, there are many things I'd say. Um, one of the best experiences I've had so far is to love someone without seeing that person. I never knew I could do it. 
there was a time when I had to accompany someone along a journey and I did not know this person. And I felt at many points throughout the journey that I would not make it. But I prayed. And in the end, amidst the pain, it was a joyful experience. It was the birth of a new baby. And so I learned to love that baby before seeing that baby born. And those experiences bring me to realize that God is in the things that we do not see. And sometimes, also, I like the idea of dreaming, mm. to dream, to share a dream together. What is that dream? I think that it's important to remember prayer and how the spirit is moving us. It is by listening from deep within our hearts that we can listen to others. God is in the things we do not see, how profound, and therefore the need for us to, the need for us to really be open to the Holy Spirit, to really ask the question, what is the Spirit saying to me? What is the Spirit is saying um, to the church? Um, wow, Th thanks for that, uh, thanks for that, uh, Miriam. Um, uh, to Teresa, on a practical level, um, how can young people and uh, the elderly and the laity really get involved in this synodal process, this synodal journey, as I prefer to call it? How can they get involved practically so that they can experience what Miriam has just shared with us or just testified um, so that they can learn about others and learn about themselves and, and, and come to identify the presence of, of the Holy Spirit in their midst. How can they get involved practically? Well, as the, the words that are being used to guide the Synod kind of represents part communion, participation, and mission. I think it really centers around that because it echoes something that Miriam would have said. Um, if you're not participating, then there is no capacity for you to have those experiences. Yeah, yeah. First and foremost, um, we, and I say that the laity here, but also persons who are involved in church, have to open up this opportunity for participation. So I think that before we even get to how do the, the wider laity get involved, we have to recognize there's a responsibility that those who know provide the opportunities. But I think it first starts with participation. Um, participation that is grounded in prayer um, and participation that is grounded in empathy and the fruits of the spirit. Because Mir Miriam said it so eloquently, this is not an easy journey. This will not be an easy journey. And we on some level have to accept that this is going to be difficult. We may hear things we don't want to hear. We may experience things we don't want to experience, but we also have to come to terms with that is the definition of the Christian journey itself. Uh, and so if we are to walk together, um, you know, if, if you want to be very biblical about it, think of the Israelites leaving the desert, you know, and, and Moses in front and I like to use, you know, Charles and Heston and the Ten Commandments movie. <laughs> you know, it looks all pretty when you, you see it as a movie, but think of what it must have been to walk together in a desert. That's not an easy journey. Um, so for the laity to participate, there is a level of acceptance, a, a level of openness that we have to provide for the spaces and the places and the opportunities. But then we're also going to have to, as a part of the journey, teach the, the type of openness and willingness to participate because it is from that that communion and mission will spring. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I see there's a very clear path for responsible engagement of the lady. Thank you, thank you. You know, Bishop Miles there, uh, Teresa spoke about the fact that this is not going to be an easy journey. 
Um, and she used the, the biblical metaphor of Moses and the people of Israel in the desert. And you and I know, we all know what that experience was about. It wasn't an easy one. Um, what are some of the challenges you foresee for the AEC, for the people of the Antilles Episcopal Conference um, will encounter um, yeah. on this journey together to listen? Right. Now, I, I see the, 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 the challenges are multiple. Um, it, of course, we would have, first of all, to do with, uh, with our perception of the reality, what we are engaged in. We would say that we have done that before. We have gone that route. We have seen many synods, and we ask ourselves, what has, what, what has come out of, 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 of all these? We, we, we would be um, experiencing, I think, a certain level of fear, of fear of the, the experience becoming a talk shop, you know? that people come and talk and people come and gripe maybe, um, people come and, and, and shed off the, the frustrations about the church and um, whether we were going to get anywhere with, with those. Um, one of the, the consideration too is the question of the, the time limit that we have to achieve all this. Some people are afraid that we don't have enough time to, to really, um, uh, experience all that is needed to, to, to or discuss all that needed to be discussed in order to, to, to get to something. Then the question of the outreach, how do we get to all these people that we want to include in the process? Um, whether we will have the, the structures in place, then we will question the question, the thing of implementation. After we have talked a lot, we have discussed and we have put all the documentation together um, people might be wondering, is anything going to come out of this? You know, are we going to really achieve the goal that we set ourselves? Now, of course, these are obstacles in the way. But on the other hand, I, I, I see it, um, although you didn't ask this question, I see it as such a moment of grace, a, 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 a moment of possibilities for the church, you know. So despite all the challenges, all the questions that people will be asking, I see it a glimmer of hope beyond all that. Because um, if the spirit is in the middle of this, in the center of it, and we, we, we are determined to listen to the voice of the spirit, um, that I, I think the sky is the limit for that. Now, within that same aspect of the spirit is the challenge of um, the listening part. Are we going to dispose ourselves sufficiently to really listen? I, 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 I in fact, only this morning I was speaking to one of one of the priests, and um, we were discussing an issue, uh, and we were speaking about the tendency to color what we want to hear people say, what what type of question we want them to answer, and how we expect them to answer. I believe that one of the biggest struggles we have is to be absolutely humble, absolutely humble about what people have in their mind to, 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 to talk about, to share with us, to help us understand who we are and where we are as church. And that is difficult. That is difficult. The danger of um, clouding our minds or... Um, psyching ourselves to determine what we expect to hear. I think Carissa referred, um, um, Teresa referred to that a bit, that we will be hearing what we would rather not hear. It's the, the absolute humility that is required for us to just go as a tabula rasa, just let people talk, let people share the, their feelings so that we would know exactly where the church is at. We could have all kinds of highfalutin yeah. images about where the church is at. But whether we are reaching the people where they are is really the question. And I think um, the challenge of becoming an absolutely humble church to accept the truth where it is, is a big challenge. It's, it certainly is. Um, the, 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 the fundamental challenge of humanity is how do we prevent ourselves from clouding our mind and, and um, predicting what people are going to be saying. Uh, 
how do we listen to each other non-judgmentally, openly? Mm -hmm. That is certainly a, a, a challenge. Um, and, and that brings me to the next area that I'd like to explore with both Teresa and Miriam with respect to, okay, if this is what our dream is, um, you know, listening non-judgmentally to each other and open, how do we open, how do we prepare rather, how do we prepare persons to listen? To, to listen non-judgmentally, to listen openly. Can you share with us and our listeners uh, maybe some practical ways in which we can prepare persons? Sure, um, I think, I, I genuinely believe this is a, really a conversation about prayer. Mm -hmm. I think that in the fullness of trying to understand what it means to listen, what it means to be open, there is an intimate relationship that we have to practice with to be able to figure out what that is like. And that means a deepening of our own relationship with God. Um, without that, fundamentally, we will continue to have a bias imposed by ourselves. And I say that also too because with, I think this synod on synodality is actually an opportunity to teach us how to listen and not an end in itself. And so if we take this opportunity to, to say to the church, to say to all of us, to say to ourselves, how do we pray and how do we manifest what is God's desire for us? then we can now transpose that to another person. What could that look like? I think all of us, um, the, the tradition that we have as Catholics is wide when it comes to prayer and format of prayer and liturgy and all of these things. I think that by engaging all of us in that understanding of what is prayer, what does it mean to be listened to, um, it, it sets up a template. And it means it's going to affect our liturgy. It's going to affect contemplative prayer. It's going to affect all of the prayer movements. And so there, there is the first challenge, I think. Um, and though it may sound more spiritual than practical, I think if we don't do that, the other parts are going to become far more difficult because we may intellectualize the entire process or we may push it into a space of being very psychological and so on. But we're talking about the whole person. So we have to start at that place of, of, of the spiritual context. Um, and of course, all the logistics will fall in place, but I want to pass it over to Miriam. Sure. That, yes, you. Miriam. Mm -hmm. um, I often use the image of a family reunion when I talk about this thing. Uh, I come from a large family and sometimes we have situations where we argue and we fight. And the theme of forgiveness is something so important that I experienced growing up. And to be able to forgive others and for others to forgive me, I think that's a, a way that I have learned to be more open to people. So sitting around a table when I don't, agree with maybe someone who has a different opinion um, is one of the ways that I think I can be a bit more open to listening in this synod process. We often look at older people in the family, our grandparents, and if we take some time to listen to them and to hear their stories, we can learn so many things about life. If we take some time to listen to the young people, they can teach us to be innovative, creative, and even challenge us to broaden our horizons. Our parents, they are so important. They love and support us. And I think together, through prayer and faith, we can, in fact, go where God is calling us. So Teresa and uh, Miriam have reminded us of the, the importance 
the foundation of prayer, prayer in this process. Um, the first experiencing what it means to be listened to, as Teresa reminds us, that you know, fundamentally in prayer, God listens to us. And having that experience of being listened to, uh, how can we uh, live that listening? And uh, Miriam has uh, gifted us with the metal of the family, the family reunion, how members of family come together, sit around a table, uh, notwithstanding differences, and uh, the experience of, of, of forgiving each other, you know, all that dynamics that, that goes on in, in, in family life. But thanks, uh, Teresa and Miriam, for offering us those two very powerful insights. And, you know, we're coming to the, 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 the launch of this synod, this synodal journey um, on Sunday, Sunday the 17th in the respective dioceses throughout the world and also in the Caribbean church. And so I, I'll ask um, Bishop Miles to just to briefly share with us, okay, after the launch, what is expected um, of the church after the launch in the respective dioceses on Sunday? Well, um, of course, even now it is presumed that a lot has been prepared in terms of um, each diocese organizing its diocesan synod team. Um, and of course, meeting regularly to plan the, the strategies of meeting, of setting structures in place, putting stretching structures in place so that the listening process will be, will, will be facilitated. Um, if I'm to speak of what is happening in Roseau right now, this is exactly what is happening. So as soon as the, the, the launching is done, we'll be um, on the road to put um, the structures in place to have the, the various groups met, um, the training of the coordinators in the parish themselves so that they would know how to facilitate the various groups and uh, um, to allow that listening process, which is really, really key to the entire um, synodal journey. The allowing as many groups as possible, as every possible group in the, in the diocese to listen to each other. So this listening process has to be structured. There are varied, varied groups in the, in the diocese um, and each person or each group has to be listened to so that we would know where the church is at. So that by come February, we'll be able to call it um, the findings so that we could send it to, to you, Don, to put together and we could prepare to send to Rome so that by April, everything will be done. So we have our work cut out for us. So as we come to the end of this conversation, I'd like each of you to think for a moment and leave with our listeners either one word, one metaphor, one image uh, um, about the experience of the synod, the anticipated experience of the synod. If you should, if you should identify a word, an image, a metaphor, um, or two words to leave with our listeners, what would that be? <laughs> my, my word, my key word in this entire process is humility. Humility. Thanks, Bishop. So Bishop's word for our listeners is humility. Mine would be dare to dream. And together dare. we can dare to dream. Yes. Dare to dream. Together dare to we can make the dream a reality. In God's so, name. Okay. Thanks, Miriam. Dare to dream. And Teresa? Father Don, that was a hard question. Okay, <laughs> such a hard question. But I guess for me, it is the outpouring of grace. Um, oh. that, that this moment is like is an opportunity for a cup to run over. Um, you know, so there can be an outpouring of grace, but it really depends on how much we pour into the process. Great. Um, that's my metaphor. 
So grace would be your word, grace, outpouring of grace. Humility is Bishop's word. Dream is the word for, um, uh, from Miriam. And my word um, for our listeners and for you all is courage, courage. Be not afraid, courage. Uh, Bishop Miles there, Teresa Best Downs and Miriam Lourdes, thank you very much for sharing in this conversation on Sinner, that whole process of listening together to discern the, 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 what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. We certainly hope that the spirit of listening will pervade through this listening process. Thank you very much for your thank input. You. Thank you for the Thanks time. for thank listening. You. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, thank you. Father. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.